Well, thank you very much for coming today, and it's nice to be here. And whenever or wherever you might be watching, we do trust that God will bless our time as we open the scriptures and as we speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel thereof. So I want to just uh, read verse 16 of our chapter here. This is a, a question that the Lord Jesus asked, and uh, who, he, who, who do people say that I am? And that can be a question that people can ask today. Who is the Lord Jesus? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that's just a few words to us, but these words were significant, important, and profound at the time, and still to us. If anyone had to utter such words as words of belief, they would tell you a lot about that person and where their faith was and what they'd placed it in. You may wonder about the Lord Jesus, and I wonder what your thoughts are, what you consider of him, about him. Now, for some here, it might be everything to you, or you might not have that feeling and experience about him. But we're coming here today to speak about someone who was in, trod this earth about 2,000 years ago. And when you consider who he was and the impact he made, someone who never had possessions of his own, and yet you will find people today in this country and nations throughout the world who will be meeting in buildings to talk and to sing about him. He lived in a country that probably was the size of Wales. And other than seeking sanctuary as a child in Egypt, never left. And yet many nations across this earth will remember and know about Jesus Christ. And there are many facets about him that are remarkable. Who has ever lived that has made an impact like Jesus? And we're talking two millennia later from when he was here. People still know about him. People still talk about him. People follow him. We may not consider a gathering like this a great amount of people, but when you consider why we are here and what the purpose is and whom we are speaking about, is that not quite remarkable that all these years later, he still makes an impact? Why is that? What's the reason for that? We want to look to the Bible. I have read and done and taught MS courses over many years, and I've gleaned a lot about the Bible and what it has to say about Jesus Christ, what it teaches about him. And I want to just share some of these verses with you today, because I believe they'll be of benefit and of help to you. I'm read there in Matthew's Gospel, one of the four Gospels that tell us a bit about the life of Jesus Christ. Not everything, but significant portions. What I want to do is to look at just who he was. When we talk about his deity, he is divine. I want to look at some of how, how does the Bible describe that? Where do we get that from? Why are we saying these things? What is our reason for proclaiming them? Why is it important? Well, if we look at John chapter 17, verse 5, we have a verse there that tells us that Jesus Christ is eternal. That tells us something that's deeper than just a man. It says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory of which I had with you before the world was. So when I say he's eternal, the word of God is giving us a reason to say that. And everything that we would say Indeed, not just if I'm up here speaking, anyone who's up here or anywhere where they're preaching, they are telling you something from the Bible. And I was reminded 
recently, when our coronation of our king, a Bible was given to him and it was told to him, this is the most important book in the world. And I wouldn't disagree and many wouldn't disagree. The Bible has the words of life, a very authenticated book, a very reliable book, a very trustworthy book. Indeed, more can be told about the Bible and its authenticity and reliability than any other book that has ever been written. Jesus Christ is eternal. He is also present everywhere. And we can read about that, Matthew 28. And Jesus, verses 18 and 19, Jesus came, spoke to him, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And if you were to take time to go to the Old Testament and read Psalm 139, you would see there that God is present everywhere. Jesus Christ is all present. And that's a thing that is quite profound, but very important. He is also all powerful. Revelation 1 verse 8 tells us, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is Jesus himself who's speaking. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we are coming to speak of one who is all-powerful. We're also speaking of one who is all-knowing. And we read that in John chapter 22, verses 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. And he even says, Peter even says to him in John chapter 21, he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. When Peter was challenged after his, his three denials, the Lord spoke to him and part of his restoration with him. He knew the Lord knew everything. Jesus Christ is also unchangeable. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that reassuring in the world in which we live, that there's something that's the same in the past, the present, and the future? Christ is trustworthy, believable. And I think that's important, because as we go forward to speak about the value and the worth and who he was and what he accomplished, it's important to know that he has never changing. God doesn't change. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't promise. He doesn't speak. And not. So it's important when we look at the Bible, we understand that. But if God talks about heaven and talks about the hell and talks about where our eternal destiny is and where we must place our faith and our trust or not, place our faith and trust, we have to realize what the consequences of that are, of our decisions that we take. What did Jesus do? How can we look at the Bible and find out what was he about? Well, in John 1 verse 3, we says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He was the creator. He was there in the, the very beginning. Now, we have a very interesting take in the world in which we live, in the country, and the nations in which we live, where fairly say they believe that. And they might evolution. And that's how things supposedly a theory hypothesis, because it's not in any way been proved even to be a theory, never mean never mind a reality. Moses even talks in Exodus 20, 11, that God made the earth in six days, heavens and the earth. And we read that in Genesis chapter 1, and we see how God created. God said, God made in six days. He also upholds the universe. Colossians 1, 17, and he is before all things, and in him, in him all things 
consist. God didn't create and leave and go away. He sustains and he looks after. And that's important. And we should always bear that in mind. And if the environment, the world, the earth in which we live, we should remember that God is in control and God sustains. If we go to Genesis chapter 69, chapter 6 to 9, we see there of a flood, a worldwide flood, and we see the impact of that. But we also see a God who has made provision for the future and has given responsibility to man to look after, to be a steward of what we have. But that means we should look to God. We should seek his way and his purpose and his understanding. So if we are concerned of what is going on around us and wondering what is happening and what is the future, we should trust in God for he has a plan and a purpose. There'll never be another worldwide flood. He has promised that. He has sent a rainbow that is an evidence of his promise. What happens at the end of the world? Well, that's different. We'll read about that later in the New Testament and what Peter talks about there. There will be a new heaven and new earth to come. So we should be prepared for that. We should be ready for that. We should understand that. So he's a creator and he upholds, he gives life to the dead. John 5, 21 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. So there's some of the work that Jesus has done. What in the Bible? We would call Jesus Christ. Maybe people think he was a good man, a good person. Quite impressed with what he said and what he done and what they hear about him. But the Bible said more than that. It says he's called God. Now that raises our listening and our understanding higher because that is a challenge to many that Jesus Christ is called God. God the Father calls him the Son of God in Hebrews 1 verse 8. But to the Son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Men called him Christ God. John chapter 20 verse 28. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, and my God. Thomas doubted. Perhaps like some would doubt because they didn't see. But the Lord said, better those who have not seen and have believed. But Thomas recognised that who he was looking at was his Lord and his God. Even the demons recognised Jesus as God. Mark chapter 1 verse 22 saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? Know who you are. You, I know who you are, the Holy One. We read a lot about demon activity in the Gospels. If we go through that, we see a lot. There. Demons were very active, but the Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God and power over them. Christ himself. He was God. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. That's a very, very significant statement. Because we're dealing here with one who the purpose and the reason for him coming is that he is God. He came, we call it his incarnation, often referred to the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John chapter 1, verse 14. This was foretold in the Old Testament in Isaiah in chapter 7, verse 14. It says, This for the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we read of that in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. It says, The Holy Spirit will come, on, come upon you, talking to Mary, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. It's truly the most historic event in world history, Jesus Christ coming, dwelling amongst us. He was truly man. He had a body. He had a soul. He had a spirit. 
He displayed to us what the Father is like. If you want to see what God the Father is like, look at God the Son. And John chapter 14, verse 9. It tells us that, that uh, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? That you have known me? Well, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say show us the Father? We find out that he came to be a sacrifice for our sins. He came to take our sins upon himself. And he came to destroy the works of the devil. And 1 John chapter 3 tells us that he came to do that, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus Christ was truly God, but he became man, but never gave up being God. But he was a man without sin. He lived the perfect life, and his work was perfect. And that might be hard for us to comprehend such a person, but that was Jesus Christ. We learn that his death was necessary. He came and he died. We think of his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. He came to die, and he died on that cross at Calvary that we often think about. And in Acts chapter 17, Paul is talking there, and he, he, he talked from the scriptures, explaining to the people that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this is the Jesus whom I preach to you. He came to do the will of the Father. God had a plan of salvation. It went right back to Genesis chapter 3. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Because of sin coming into this world, there had to be a remedy. There had to be a plan, and God had his plan of salvation, and that was sending the Lord Jesus Christ. We look at the prophecy in the Old Testament. We could, you could do a, a study on that alone to see what God said before Jesus Christ came. There's a whole, whole thread of salvation runs right through the whole Bible, and it tells of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. It tells of what happened, and it promises the future as well. He was bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah says. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his, his stripes are we healed. He suffered for our sins. And even himself in, in, in Acts, in Luke chapter 24, and he had a conversation with two people after the resurrection on a road to Emmaus, and he showed them from the scriptures that they had at the time, the law, the prophets, and the, the scripture that the people were familiar with, he showed them where he was foretold. And what a great privilege it was for those. And we can learn and glean that, but we have to do it by our study and our own reading. But in there, in the scriptures, you will find what God had promised and what has been fulfilled already. But he suffered for our sins. He died in our place. In him, we have redemption through his blood, according to the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, verse 7. We find that uh, Christ died in our place. Paul talks a lot about that in his letters in the New Testament. Corinthians chapter 15 talks about it. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We might be thinking that things happened in the life of Jesus Christ that maybe took a twist and a turn and went in a certain direction, that maybe how could someone so good and so loving and so caring, how could what happened to him happen? But we have to see it as part of God's plan and God's purpose. And ultimately, God was seeing a perfect sacrifice and a sacrifice that involved no sin, no impurity, no 
nothing wrong, nothing embellished, no, 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 no flaw. And it had to be one that was perfect. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. He suffered for our sins and he took our place. The great thing that we must remember and rejoice in that the resurrection is a significant event for the Christian and for all those who believe and potentially for others who could believe as well. And Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus came and visited and people seen him after the resurrection. They could see, uh, behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself, handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. It was real. It wasn't an illusion. It wasn't something that people were imagining. And that can be verified because people could see the wounds that he had. And he came and stood before them. And he came even when the doors were shut. He had a different body that had changed, but it was a real body. He stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And it wasn't just a few people who witnessed. There was many appearances of Lord Jesus. First Corinthians 15, verse 17, uh, or 15 verse says, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So even at the time that that was written, people could go and vouch and verify that Jesus Christ had risen. I think it's irrefutable that the evidence that Jesus Christ rose. What is the question for most people is, do you believe the purpose and the reason of his resurrection? Or is it just something you consider a fact of history? It's a big challenge how we deal with the message of the resurrection. It's also vital for the Christian faith. Paul also says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. There's no real purpose to the Christian faith if we don't have a resurrection. Jesus Christ could just be considered a good man, a great man, a man who did great things, but he died. And that would be the end of it. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And the evidence doesn't tell us that. He rose. He's alive. And people seen him. It's, the Bible teaches us he ascended heaven. At, uh, Mark chapter 16. So then, after all the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up to, into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 1 also tells us And a cloud received him out of their sight. And the promise was given to those who witnessed that event that this same Jesus will come back in the same way. He'll come back in the clouds. And that's a promise. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he goes to prepare a place and come back for those who believe. So there's a great message across in the Bible, a great truth coming across that Jesus Christ is returned. Jesus Christ is a real person. He died, he rose and ascended, and he will return again. And I think it's something that's a challenge to each one to consider. Where do we stand before God? Are we here because we believe? Are we following him fully in our lives? Are we trusting him? Are we turning to him for salvation? Do we know him as a, our Savior and Lord? The Bible teaches us righteous. It teaches us that all have sinned the glory of God. And from God, that's 
that teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we want to recognize that we are interested, we are challenged by the message of the Bible of Jesus Christ, if we want to recognize that we have sinned, and it's important that we realize that we have sinned. Maybe sometimes people think, well, I've not done that much wrong. I'm not really that bad. But we've all sinned. None of us are perfect. Even sometimes what we think, the Lord would teach us that that is wrong, that that is sin. We might not have done crimes that merit a punishment in the eyes of the law. But against God, we have all sinned, and there's no one who is without sin. But if we recognize that and we want to repent of that sin, if we want to turn away and seek forgiveness and realize that it was our sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, it was us, each one of us, there was no sin in him, in him was no sin. He could not, he did not sin. But if we confess him with our mouth and we can say Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9. One of the favorite verses of many believers. And Romans 10 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul again writes, For it's by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The believer does not stand on their own merit before God. There is nothing that we could do to earn our salvation. The Bible is quite clear that there is nothing good in us in the eyes of God. We have sinned and fallen short. But through God's grace and God's great gift of salvation, we can repent and turn and believe. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We can have a new relationship. We can be in a new place. We can be born again by that faith and that trust in Jesus Christ. I said earlier that God's word teaches us that there is a choice for people to make. And God and his word and those who have written it speak of heaven and speak of hell. Speak of eternal destiny with God or outside of God. People can make a choice. People can see that they have sinned and erred, and that the message of the Bible of Jesus Christ is a message for you to take heed of. Many, many millions of people over the, the, the last millennium, two millennium, have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They have recognized him as who the Bible teaches he is, the Son of God, the one who was God who came and dwelt among us, took on human form, but never gave up being God. And the one who is at the right hand of God now, who is fully God and fully man, who still bears the wounds from the cross at Calvary. And it's a great challenge to everyone to consider. Does it mean anything to you? Can you say he is my saviour and my Lord? Do you follow him? Have you committed your life? fully to him? Have you trusted in him? We read earlier there that the disciples were given a commission to go into the world and preach the gospel and teach and baptize for those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, baptized and witnessed and testified in that act of being a follower, a witness of Jesus Christ in their life, a symbol of our death and our resurrection in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. It's a great message that we have, and it's a great message that has stood the test of time and will do 
And God will always have his people wherever we may be. We might be in a world of indifference today in our nation and other nations, but in other parts of this world, there are many who have put their faith and trust and still do in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it would be my prayer and the prayer of all who would come here that wherever we're listening to this message or whenever we're listening to it, we might come to realization that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And may it be that each one of us can know him as our own personal Savior and Lord. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, we give thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our prayer that each person here or listening or watching will know that experience of the joy of salvation in Jesus Christ. It is our prayer that all would consider him, seek him, find him. You have sent him into the world, and we ask our God that it would make an impact in the lives of people. We give thanks for the opportunity of gathering in this way, opening up the scriptures, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And as we would conclude our time together, ask that you would bless us and watch over us and take us on our journey safely, giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.